Um, are there questions about the second writing assignment? No, number here. Okay, all right. So, um, so this is the part of the discourse where Rousseau uh, actually answers the two parts of the academy's question. So I'm going to write up again what the two parts of the question were. So the first question is. Well, I'll just write. What is the origin of inequality among men? And the second one is, is it authorized by the law of nature? Professor? Yeah. Are the cameras blurry a little bit? Oh, yeah, I see that. Uh, let me just. Hold on. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, So, uh, so the answer to this one, to the part one, is going to be, well, it's complicated <laughs> um, because there's many different kinds of moral or political inequality among them, right? Remember, at the very beginning, he says, you don't, you're not asking about natural inequality, right? I mean, everyone knows what the origin of that is, nature. Some people are bigger, some people are smaller, some, you know, et cetera. It's not, you're not asking about that. You're asking about moral or political inequality, but there's a lot of kinds of moral or political inequality. And when he first introduced it, he listed them. Um, so he lists them. This is, well, I mean, so this is the list, um, such as being richer, more honored, more powerful than they, or even causing themselves to be obeyed by them. So there's basically, and I'm going to write this in a different order than he gives them on that list, slightly different, but... Um, Right, you're not going to be able to see that list on the screen unless I stand over here. I should have written on the other side. All right, it's too late now. Um, right, so these are types of moral or political inequality. Some people have more honor than others, some people are richer than others, some people are more powerful than others, and some people have. Um, well, as he puts this here, cause themselves to be obeyed by others. Um, and each of these different types, it turns out, has a different origin. But they, it's not like they have four independent origins. They, they're in a sequence. One comes after the other. Um, so, uh, this is on page 87. Um, near the beginning of part two. Well, I guess it's not that near the beginning, is it? No. The middle of part two. <laughs> um, Thus, the condition of rich and poor was authorized by the first epoch, that of strong and weak by the second and that of master and slave by the third. Right, so that's these three. 
So, I mean, first of all, it's, it's interesting, like, although I said when I introduced Rousseau, basically that he's less systematic than the other writers or less obviously systematic. I mean, this, these kind of casual, that kind of casual sounding list at the beginning actually like turns out to, have been, to be carefully considered because it comes back here. Now, the one that he doesn't mention here is honor, um, but um, honor, I think uh, I'll explain why that, that this is actually the first type of inequality that develops. Um, so it's before the first, what he's calling on page 87, the first epic. Um, there's already this inequality in honor. Um, Okay, so that's gonna be the answer to part one. What about the answer to part two? Is this inequality authorized by the law? Oh, I didn't finish writing this. I think there's someone told me the panel. Is it authorized by the law of nature? So the answer to that also is gonna be no. Not also. The answer to that is gonna be no, at least, uh, not the way it now exists. Now, um, every once in a while, he mentions another way that things could go besides the, the way they usually go, which is what he's talking about, I guess. And the exception always seems to be the same exception. It's always Sparta. <laughs> um, so, uh, Sparta apparently did not develop in the same bad way that other societies develop, right? Like this is one of the main places he mentions this is on page 81. Um, people, so he's talking about the way like uh, um, most societies got off to the wrong start. And only after a while did they start to realize the inconveniences that were caused by their bad start. And they tried to kind of like patch them up as they went along. But since the like defect was, was built in, they never really could, could get ahead of it. And so this is the continuation of this. People were continually patching it up, whereas they should have begun by clearing the air and putting aside all the old materials as Lycurgus did in Sparta in order to raise a good edifice later on, right? Like Kyrgyz is like that semi-legendary lawgiver of Sparta. Um, and when I say he's the lawgiver of Sparta, like Sparta existed before, at least like I said, semi-legendary. Like, I don't know if we're even sure there was such a person as Kyrgyz or whatever, but at least according to the story, Sparta <laughs> existed before like Kyrgyz. But like Kyrgyz, and like Kyrgyz was exiled from Sparta, and then he came back and he said, you know, I have this new plan for like completely redoing our society. Um, and uh, the Oracle at Delphi has, has like uh, backs me up. <laughs> and he got friends to, together with him and they, you know, whatever. There's a whole story about how it happened. But yeah, so basically, like they completely remade Spartan society from the ground up. That's the story. Um, and, you know, because of the way that Sparta was refounded, according to Rousseau, Sparta remained um, in a certain sense natural and uncivilized. Um, and uh, there was basically no distinction of rich and poor and almost no laws, no distinction of rich and poor among the citizens of Sparta, right? Now, so this is actually important, right? In, um, in Sparta, there were Spartans and there were the helots and most people were helots and the helots were slaves, <laughs> but the, but the, the, the Spartans who were citizens of Sparta had this equality among each other and uh, um, 
you shaking your head saying they didn't have equality in my well, I mean, there's uh, how do you say this? Uh, as far as I understand it, no, like they were equal, like they're all citizens, but um, there were like incredibly wealthy Spartans that owned like on more land than like either of the dynasties, and uh, they were oftentimes just ended up to go to the, the nations of these, these wealthy dominions and, and beg them for war resources. Hmm. Well, okay. So I guess like the reality didn't match the theory, but the theory, according to Lycurgus, was that everyone was supposed to be on an equal footing and everyone was supposed to eat together. And yeah, I don't know what actually. So um, that's probably a, a good reminder that not only the history, but even like what happened later is a little bit of a fable. <laughs> Right. But anyway, so according to Rousseau, this was like a, a, a city without the kind of inequalities. There were inequalities there, but they were not like the bad kind of inequalities that existed in other cities that developed in the usual bad way. Um, um, and so according to Rousseau, Sparta remained free, whereas other societies are enslaved. Right, so this is uh, on page eighty-two. Um, I know the I know the delights of your country," said Brasidas to a satrap who compared the life of Sparta to that of Persepolis. Right, so Persepolis is the obviously the per capital of the Persian Empire. So like he's comparing the life in Sparta to the life of uh, in the Persian Empire, and the satrap is saying, "Boy, we have you know all this." like luxury and stuff that you guys don't have. And Brasidas says, I know the delights of your country, but you cannot know the pleasures of mine. Um, oh, I guess I didn't read the first part of it, other, which shows why it's relevant. Um, It is the same for liberty as it is for innocence and virtue. Their value is felt only as long as one has them oneself, and the taste for them is soon lost, as is as soon lost as one has lost them. And then follows that that supposed uh, speech of Brasidas to the uh, satrap, right, saying like, since our since our good is freedom, you can't appreciate it because you don't have it. You've lost your taste for it. Um, so, I mean, the fact that Sparta is supposed to be an exception here um, is going to be important when we read the social contract, because um, as you see, as soon as we start the social contract, it seems like he's talking about a completely different type of society than he is in the discourse. Um, and um, uh, and uh, perhaps the way of reconciling them is that in the social contract, he's talking about this weird exceptional case. Sparta, he also, he spends a lot of time in the, in the social contract talking about the Roman Republic, which was not quite as weird a society as Sparta, but still seems to meet Rousseau's approval. Um, Um, so that's one reason that's important to keep in mind that he's leaving room for some exception to what he's saying in the discourse. But I guess another reason why it's important is that we'll see that Wollstonecraft finds Rousseau's kind of like cult of Sparta to be like ridiculous and, and disgusting. <laughs> okay, so, um, so it's worth paying attention to this for that reason too. But okay, but leaving Sparta aside for now, um, uh, the answer to part two is going to be that all moral or political inequality violates the law of nature. So why does it violate the law of nature? Well, first of all, what what is the law of nature exactly? <laughs> um, and um, so like Rousseau, even though the law of nature is mentioned in the question that he's answering, and even though Hobbes and Locke spend a lot of time defining what the law of nature is and explaining what it is, Rousseau doesn't mention the law of nature or the right of nature very often in this book. Um, 
he does discuss the phrase in the preface, which I didn't assign, although uh, um, I don't think he necessarily endorses the phrase there. But in any case, within the book itself, um, as far as I know, he only mentions it, first mentions it when it's no longer in effect. Right, this is on page 79 at the bottom. With civil rights thus having become the common rule of citizens, the law of nature no longer was operative, except between the various societies when, under the name of the law of nations, it was temp well, whatever. Then more things about agreements between different societies. But the point is, so um, right. So he first mentions the law of nature here when he says the law of nature was no longer operative at a certain stage. Um, so that obviously doesn't really tell us what the law of nature was when it was in effect. So he talks about it at the end on page 91. Well, at least he talks about natural right. Moreover, it follows that inequality in status authorized by positive right alone is contrary to natural right whenever it is not combined in the same proportion with physical inequality. Right, physical and natural mean the same thing. It's just Greek and Latin. So uh, um, by physical inequality, he means natural inequality. So, um, so uh, inequality and in status authorized by, um, or in other words, moral inequality. If you look in the footnote, they decided to translate that as inequality and in status. But moral inequality authorized by positive right alone is contrary to natural right whenever it is not combined in the same proportion with physical inequality, a distinction that is sufficient to determine what one should think in this regard about the sort of, sort of inequality that reigns among all civilized people. For it is obviously contrary to the law of nature, or here he does say law of nature, however it may be defined, for a child to command an old man, for an imbecile to lead a wise man, and for a handful of people to gorge themselves on superfluities while the starving multitude lacks necessities. And that's the end of the discourse. So here it looks like law of nature, the law of nature, he's taking it to mean the rule of the strongest, but um, where strongest refers to natural inequality. So the later laws are going to be laws of the rule of the strongest, strongest in other artificial senses of strong, right? Like rich, powerful, or authorized to command. Um, That's what law of nature seems to mean at the end when he gives his official answer to the question. And, you know, the law of nature in that sense, uh, you could say, although it, it quote unquote binds in the original state of nature, it's really not relevant in the original state of nature. Because in the original state of nature, no one has the occasion to compare themselves to someone else. <laughs> so um, the fact that some people are naturally stronger or otherwise, you know, uh, either as we would say, physically stronger or uh, or otherwise naturally stronger than some others, just doesn't even register with them because they're not making that comparison. So, um, so to get from that state to this final state of unnatural inequality, 
we the the first step is going to be to actually um, notice natural inequality. <laughs> Um, and according to Rousseau, that takes a long time. And, you know, the first thing that's, um, the first thing that's missing is that um, in the original state of nature, nothing much usually catches my, someone's attention, right? They're just kind of like drifting along. There's some acorns, there's some water, time to sleep. Wait, they're not like paying careful attention to things in order to compare them. And so the very first step on the path that's gonna lead to, a, although Rousseau doesn't think it necessarily had to lead to this, but anyway, the, the, the path that eventually leads to moral and political inequality is, um, when something forces us to pay attention. And this happens, he says, because the, although the state of nature was pretty easy, as he argued last time, life was pretty easy. It wasn't completely easy. Sometimes there were problems, right? So the first thing he says, this is the top of page 70, difficulties soon presented themselves to him. It was necessary to learn to overcome them. So like some trees were too high to get the fruit or, you know, like there were various challenges that came up. Um, some animals wanted to eat the same fruit that they did. Um, um, and uh, these difficulties, he goes on to say, kind of like changed and multiplied as time went on because people like moved into new environments that were not as like suited to them as their original ones, I guess. Um, or because, you know, there were unusual natural events. So like if the fruits failed one year, they had to stop and suddenly say, okay, what do we eat now that the fr there's no fruits? Right, or if they moved into a place where it was cold, too cold for animals like themselves, they had to say, oh, wait. I mean, they didn't have language to do this in, but still they, they had to stop and, and consider, okay, how else could I get warm? Um, and so they learned to like do or make various different things depend, compare, depending on the circumstances. And that's what starts the first comparisons. Like they compare um, themselves as the same to the changing circumstances that they have to deal with, I think is the first comparison he thinks that humans make. And um, especially, um, it seems like, although this isn't quite, I'm not sure what the explanation for this is, but it seems like especially they start to pay attention to um, the difference between different animals. This, anyway, this is the explanation of it. The repeated, this repeated counterposition of the various creatures to himself and of each species to the others much nat must naturally have engendered in man's mind a perception of certain relations. These relationships, which we express by the words large, small, strong, weak, fast, slow, timorous, bold, and other similar ideas, um, comparisons carried out when needed and almost without thinking about it, finally produced in him a kind of reflection, or rather a mechanical prudence that pointed out to him the precautions that were most necessary for his safety. So this, is, this state is um, still like a pre-savage state, according to Rousseau, right? Like it's still close to the original state of nature, but it's slightly different. 
um, I would call it the enlightened state of nature or something like that, because he says, um, this new enlightenment that resulted, sorry, the new enlightenment that resulted from this development increased his superiority over the other animals by making him aware of it. Right, so the human beings in this new state are thinking about themselves and comparing themselves to other animals. Um, and in particular, they start to notice that um, they have certain advantages over the other animals. And noticing that they have the advantages makes the advantages better, right? That's what he's saying when he says that um, increased his superiority over the other animals by making him aware of it. So like they start to realize, I can figure out how to set a trap that the other animals won't understand, for example. Um, At the same time, or for the, I guess for the same reason, the, these solitary human beings in this new state start to notice that they have something in common with each other, right? So like at the same time that they notice that they're different from the other animals, they start noticing that they're kind of the same as each other. Um, so, so the first thing they notice is not the inequality between human beings, but the equality between human beings. Um, in fact, um, Rousseau says that the first kind of pride they feel is like a species pride, that they start to feel proud to be human and not some other animal. Um, So this is at the bottom of page 70, top of page 71. The conformities that over time he could perceive between them, that is the other humans, his female and himself. So maybe I should have said the other men, right? Because <laughs> here again, all of a sudden it turns out that we weren't talking about women, strangely. <laughs> um, strangely in part because the first thing that that quote unquote he noticed about quote unquote his female is how similar they were to each other. Right? The first thing he notices the conformities between them. Um, also, I don't understand what his female means here because I thought that they were, um, I mean, I know from what he says later that at this stage, he thinks that they still only met for the, you know, act of copulation and then separated. So it's, there's, there's maybe his female just means the, like the female sex of his species or something. I don't know, any case, um, um, the, I mean, these, these indications are, or like weirdnesses are important, but they're not from Rousseau's point of view, they're not the, the point here. The point here is that, you know, the first thing that human beings noticed about each other is how similar the others were. And that, noticing that leads to a kind of, um, embryonic political science. Even though they don't even have language yet, I think. It's not clear where, you know, you mentioned in part one, he talked about the problems of accounting for language. Then when he tells this history in part two, it's not clear where the invention of language is supposed to fit into this history. But I take it this point is still pre-linguistic. But nevertheless, um, they start to realize that as Hobbes says, you know, I can know how other people will act by consulting my own nature. Yes, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm really confused on like, um, what you were saying about 
Yeah, it is, like I said, he doesn't say a lot about it and it is confusing. So what I already said is at the end, when he answers the Academy's question, he takes the law of nature to mean like, um, who is naturally stronger than, than who, than who, and you know, and that those people should be in control. And since that's not the case in society, and so oftentimes we find the younger, uh, you know, uh, commanding the older or the weaker, but it's like physically weaker, commanding the stronger and so forth, that we can see that the that, that polit moral and political inequality are not authorized by the law of nature. I mean, um, that's not presumably what the academy meant when they asked whether it's authorized by the law of nature. Right, I mean, that's not what Locke or Hobbes mean by the law of nature. Moreover, as I was pointing out, according to Rousseau, this, this, this law of nature was not in effect in the original state of nature. Because even though some people were stronger and some people were weaker or whatever, that didn't result in any ability for some people to command others. So I think, I mean, I'm gonna point out, I think there comes a point not in the very last paragraph of part two, where Rousseau answers a different question, namely, which takes, which could be stated in terms of the law of nature, but the law of nature as Hobbes or Locke means it, that is the law of reason. And so, um, and, the, and the answer is still gonna be no, it's not authorized by the law of nature. Um, but um, somehow, at, I think I can kind of understand why, but that he, you know, he doesn't, uh, he prefers to answer this other question the way he interprets it, no, at the end in an explicit way and kind of like, play down his answer to, to the, what the real question here is, even though it's also no. Um, does, that, does that help at all? All right. But I mean, I guess the main part of my answer to your, que to your question or like saying I'm confused about it is, yes, it's confusing what he means by it. You should be confused by it. So, um, okay, so getting back to this, Right, so, you know, as, as Hobbes says, like, how can I learn political science? Mostly by observing myself. Um, right, remember he has that thing about um, how like people think they understand human beings because they have a lot of experience with them in the world, but that that's not really sufficient. You know, you have an ex your experience is never broad enough and whatever. And the real way to do it is to consult your own nature. So that's, that's the way these people start also. They start thinking, ah, we're so similar. Those people are gonna act in a certain situation in the same way I would act. And that gives them, as he says on page 71, this is how men could imperceptibly acquire some crude idea of mutual commitments and of the advantages to be had in fulfilling them. So um, they start to realize, oh, let's see, um, like if, if that person over there would help me catch this deer, I would help them. So they would probably help me too. So let's see if I can get it going, right? Um, they can't talk about it yet, but they can kind of like gesture to each other. And, um, you know, I, although actually, did I say this before in this class? I said this in some class this quarter, but it might've been my seminar. <laughs> but like, you know, that, that if you point at something, a cat will look at your finger, not at what you're pointing at. <laughs> Right. Uh, so, like, um, 
there's there's already a lot going into the fact that we can even gesture to each other in certain ways. Um, but so anyway, they they like um, they're able to work out these what Hobbes would call contracts. They're not able to work to work out the type of contract that Hobbes calls a covenant. The contract is always for what's going to happen right now, right? So actually, the continuation of that sentence that I read before is, but only insofar as present and perceptible interests could require it. And the reason is, however, not the reason Hobbes would give. It's not that they can't trust each other to fulfill the terms in the future. It's that they don't have enough foresight of the future to even think about that. Yeah. Uh, I was just a little confused. So is this like pre-linguistic? This is like they, they're making these contracts without any uh, ability to speak, except with gestures or what? Yeah. So by contract, I mean, of course, like he says, it's a crude idea of mutual commitments and of the advantages to be had in fulfilling them. And th that example of hunting a deer was the, like, is, is one of his examples. Right, like kind of, you know, uh, you like notice the deer is running away from that person over there, and you're like, <laughs> and they they're like, they like realize, oh yeah, if I go there, then maybe he'll go there, and then right, so like, and then we can catch the deer together. But as he says, um, actually, I'll just read it. Were it a matter of catching a deer, everyone was quite aware that he must faithfully keep to his post in order to achieve this purpose. But if a hare happened to pass within reach of one of them, no doubt he would have pursued it without giving a second thought. And that having obtained his prey, he cared very little about causing his companions to miss theirs. Right? So it's like, as long as we're all doing something together, we all understand the advantages of that. But as soon as we see something else, we're like, okay, bye. <laughs> Um, so, so far, this is this kind of quasi proto society of equals. But the whole thing works based on everyone expecting everyone else to do the same thing they would do in a certain situation. They're not thinking about the difference between them. Um, so how do they start thinking about the difference between different people? Um, so it looks like, so first of all, I guess I should write, maybe we should write these stages up here. There's the original state of nature. Right, so that's where life is solitary and brutish, but not nasty and short. It's just kind of pleasant, <laughs> right? Um, and then there's what I was calling the enlightened state of nature. It's a lot like the original state of nature, except that people are starting to compare themselves to other animals and to each other. And based on that, they're, they're able to start doing like just for temporary purposes, starting to act together to achieve things. Yeah. Do you have another question? No. no. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, but the next stage is what I would call the savage state. And I call it that, like, I mean, I'm, Rousseau doesn't give names to these stages, but like I would call it the savage state because Rousseau says, most of the savages or many of the savages that we meet are, are still in this state. So this is the first state that um, we actually still see examples of, according to Rousseau. And this state also contains the first inequality. And like I said, I think apparently the first inequality is inequality of honor. Um, so, I mean, there's a whole uh, story about exactly how this happened. Um, 
and how we moved on from this to the next stage. And as I think I mentioned um, when I introduced Rousseau, like this story is not accurate. <laughs> like the stages are not in the right order. Um, but, um, but nevertheless, the way he describes what happened is still, you know, and I mean, he doesn't really, he doesn't understand how nomadic hunter gatherers actually live. He doesn't, you know, like, but uh, nevertheless, I think the, the, the story is interesting, even if it's not true. So, so the story is that, um, that the first thing that develops is a sedentary lifestyle. And that's what leads to the savage state. So, meaning that someone invents the house, as he, or I guess he calls it a hut, right? Because, like, if savages build something, it's a hut. <laughs> but I'm going to call it a house, right? So someone invents a house. Um, and uh, as soon as they invent that, they start staying in the same place. And after a while, they like get to know their neighbors. So what happened before in both of these states where people are just wandering around in the forest and they may meet one time, maybe in this state, they might even do something together one time, but then they wander away and they never see each other again. Now, because they've settled down, because they've built houses, um, they start to get to know their neighbors and have continuing interactions with them. Um, so we're imagining a time when um, uh, people still had nothing but their natural advantages and disadvantages, but now they've started to stick around with each other um, and make comparisons. I guess so, right? So, like the fundamental thing here, the fundamental reason the sedentary state is nature is necessary to progress from here to here is that once people, I was saying they have continuing interactions, but maybe that's actually gesturing toward a different theory of the origin of society. What, what's important from his point of view is that because they see the same people over and over, they start to compare the different people to each other. Right, so before they just noticed that humans are pretty similar to each other compared to other animals. But now that they're living with the same people all the time, they start to notice that some people are different than others. That's the fundamental thing that this allows according to him. And, um, and so like um, in particular, uh, this, like makes things into advantages, which, yeah, did you? Yeah, I'm, I'm just a little confused. So like, is the savage state of nature? Because there's like, it seems like there's like a, there's two different kinds of comparison in the enlightened state and the savage state, right? Because like the, because it, it, there's a, in part of the reading, it says that like, each one began to look at the others and to want to be looked at himself. Yeah. And public esteem had value. Right. So, so like that's, that's in the sta savage state. Right. So, but then, and so, so is there like an element of like judgment or like, or like, like disdain in the stat in the savage state that wasn't in well, the enlightenment? Yeah, state? that's what I'm saying. The first form of inequality is inequality uh -huh. of honor. Right. So they start to notice differences between each other. But I was, and I was about to say the differences they notice like may not have been um, uh, important advantages in the state of nature. But now they become important advantages. And this is his explanation of how it happens. This is on page 73. People grew accustomed to gather in front of their huts or around a large tree, song and dance, 
true children of love and leisure, became the amusement or rather the occupation of idle men and women who had flocked together. Each one began to look at the others and to want to be, that, that leads into what you were reading, right? So the reason, like, um, so that they start comparing each other, but, um, but like, the important comparison is not, oh, I see that person is taller than me or something like that. The important comparison is like, oh, I see that people can hold everyone else's attention better than me because he dances better than I do, right? So like in this state, dancing well, like was not a, you know, an advantage of any kind. If, I don't know if these people were dancing, but if they were, no one was watching them. <laughs> so, um, um, but here, all of a sudden, it becomes a matter of esteem, right? Like people, you know, this person is popular because they dance and sing better than everyone else. But why wouldn't that create like, um, just like some sort of like contempt that would descend into ha like Hobbes' understanding of the state of nature where everyone is like, you know, everyone wants what the other person has and stuff like that. Well, um, so it does to a certain extent, right? I mean, he says this is where violence between humans first starts out. Because, you know, as Hobbes predicts, honor is like a cause of conflict, right? Like, I mean, I want um, other people to, uh, it's, it starts with noticing actual differences between people. And those differences make some people esteemed more than others. But what I want when I see that is to be is not to necessarily be a better dancer or whatever. What I want is to be esteemed. <laughs> so um, so there's like an inherently violent goal that arises, namely to like get other people to esteem me at the same rate that I esteem myself as Hobbes puts it, and Rousseau also puts it. So that's like, um, you know, uh, suddenly a reason to use force on people in principle. Um, however, Rousseau doesn't think that that turns into a war of all against all. Um, or that the savage state is a miserable state. It has certain disadvantages over the state of nature. There's a beginning of violence, uh, contempt, vanity, like all stuff like that. Um, but uh, Rousseau actually says that, um, although he doesn't really prove this very conclusively, but he asserts that this state was actually better than what came before or what came after, right? So like, remember at the beginning, he was like, you want, you'll, you'll wanna watch to see at what stage you would have stopped. Like what was the best stage, right? He compared it to like, to, to thinking about what age you would prefer to have stopped aging at. <laughs> he says, so, so it turns out that the answer is supposed to be this stage. If we could have stopped the progress of humanity, this is the state we should have stopped it in. So that implies that the people we know now who are savages are in, are in a better state than we are. Notice. Um, and, um, um, and it, moreover, it almost could have stopped there. Ray Rousseau says, this is on page 74, uh, this must have been the happiest and most durable epoch, right? Like this situation was very stable. Of course, this, these were also very stable, right? Remember he keeps saying how it took ages and ages for this to change, but apparently this is even more so. He says the most durable epoch. 
right? Which explains, I guess, why we don't see anyone in these stages anymore. Right? But we do still see people in these this stage, according to Rousseau. Because even though these last for a long time, eventually they run out and then this starts and this lasts even longer. Um, and why was it better? Well, I mean, and why wasn't it a war of all against all? Well, I mean, so, um, you can kind of force someone to, to honor you, you know, by violence, but you can't like take away someone's honor and like keep it for yourself. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I think Rousseau thinks that limits the, ex, you know, how much this violence will break out. Yeah. So um, it's not about like, because in Hobbes, it's like about, or he thinks that you can like, that it can, like a scheme in this sense can be like taken and given to someone in like a material way. But Rousseau saying that like, when someone sees someone has a scheme, they don't want that, that person's esteem, but they want to like develop it for themselves. Yeah. And well, so I, yeah, I don't know if that's, the, I mean, that's true, but I'm not sure if that's the, now I'm thinking more, what's the difference between him and Hobbes? I mean, it's, you know, so. I think Hobbes's people are also thinking that honor is power and that they can use it to like kill their opponents or something. That's, although that's not very, yeah, no, I don't know. Maybe that's not the issue because I don't know how you would do that in Hobbes' state of nature. Uh, yeah, maybe. And surely Hobbes, and when, when I remember the way he discusses it, no, he doesn't say you can take someone else's honor and keep it for yourself. <laughs> that doesn't really make sense. Um, he, he just emphasizes that, uh, I, think, I, I think maybe actually the real difference is this, Rousseau thinks in this state that people still don't have very much foresight. Right, like, I'm just thinking about this now, but that, you know, so Hobbes's people in the state of nature are thinking like, if I don't force this person to show me esteem now, everyone else is gonna notice. And then what's gonna happen? Like eventually I'm gonna be held in contempt by everyone and whatever. But these people for in Rousseau are because as, uh, um, as I'm going to describe in a moment, that he thinks that foresight really develops with the development of agriculture, and these people haven't done that yet. So these people are just thinking, like, in the moment, they want to be esteemed. And it could give rise to some kind of scuffle or something, but it can't give rise to a war. I think that's the difference, but I'm not sure. I have my put my finger on it. Anyway, it's for sure that Rousseau, you know, Rousseau says, yeah, there's a certain amount of bloodshed in this state, but it's basically still peaceful. Um, he also says, and I'm pointing this out, even though he doesn't make such a big deal about it, but it seems like important. And also, again, since we're going on to read Wollstonecraft, that gives it a special importance. He says that this is the stage at which um, a division of labor between men and women first arose. Um, and he doesn't explain exactly why, but I take it it's again because of nursing. I mean, I know he mentions that other places that um, this is all he says on page 72. Um, oh, here we go. 
Women became more sedentary and grew accustomed to watch over the hut and the children, while the man went out to seek their, seek their common subsistence. Um, um, so yeah, like I said, he doesn't say why. Why did the women become more sedentary? Why did the men go out and seek their common subsistence? But I'm assuming it's because even though in this state, the women would just go around hunting while nursing their children with the other hand. <laughs> um, once uh, people were living together long enough to, uh, he, he just kind of, in fact, he says husband here, right? Like he, without explaining it, suddenly marriage has come into the picture. Again, I take it it's because people are living near each other. And actually, he does explain that to some extent. You know, he says how um, that because they kept you, they kept seeing again the people they had relationships with before. Or they they developed an attachment to them. That was basically the origin. Of it. So, I mean, it's interesting that the origin of it is not that you need both parents to take care of the children. That was the origin of it according to Locke. According to Rousseau, the, the original way it arises is just that people like kind of develop an attachment to each other. But then taking care of the children does come into it at this second stage, so to speak, because since the woman is nursing the infant, and there's this like handy other person around who can't nurse the infant. Um, um, she's like, well, you know, you go hunt and I'll stay here and hold the baby with both hands. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so that's how that starts according to Rousseau. Now, I mean, at this point, there's no obvious like power difference involved in this. Or if there were, it wouldn't be clear which way it would go, right? I mean, in some sense, it sounds like the woman is like, you know, saying, well, I'll stay here and take it easy while you go out and get stuff and bring it back for us. Um, so, uh, um, but uh, it is the origin, I guess, according to Rousseau, of something that develops into a kind of moral or political inequality inequality that didn't exist in the state of nature, according to him. Um, so why doesn't he make a big deal about it? Well, you know, perhaps because it's not a kind of inequality among men. <laughs> Again, there's some ambiguity about what question we're actually talking about here. Okay, but so in any case, that's all he says about that in this place. Um, so uh, the savage state, like I said, is pre is very, very stable, according to Rousseau. And it's very stable because I take it that the thing that ends it is going to be the discovery of iron, how to make iron tools. And Rousseau says that was very unlikely. It took a long time because, you know, he gives this whole explanation of how iron is buried in the earth and it's in places where there aren't a lot of trees, so there wouldn't be fires there, and like a whole complicated. But anyway, he's just saying like uh, it was very uh, um, unlikely to discover by accident how to mine and, and forge iron. But eventually, somehow, perhaps he says, due to a volcano, they 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 started to figure out how to do it, um, and uh, um, and that was what eventually brought the savage state to an end, um, and resulted in a new state. I mean, I'm not sure what to call this, but because it's still not political society, but it's the, 
it's the state where there's properties. That's the result of discovering iron in a complicated way that I'm about to describe. But um, so, um, um, as soon as property, and by property, Rousseau mostly means real property, right? That is land. He also mentions cattle. Um, so, but he's mostly thinking about land. And as soon as this, uh, this real property in land um, develops, we have this new form of inequality, rich and poor. And he, you know, he explains how that happens, how like, you know, I mean, it's similar to what we saw in Locke. Some people just start to build up more and more land. And eventually the other ones who haven't done it find themselves surrounded by like big landholders on every side. And they're suddenly poor, even though they, nothing, they haven't changed. <laughs> just because the other people got rich and took up all the land. Um, so, um, so the way this immediately came about, according to Rousseau, was by the invention of agriculture. So I guess I should write these two things, and this is the order according to him, right? So first we had the invention of houses, then we had the invention of iron, and then we had the invention of agriculture. As I already said before, this is wrong, but okay, it's interesting to see how he explains it because some really important ideas come up in the explanation, even if it's not historically correct. So, um, um, so the reason that property follows immediately from the discovery of agriculture is that, um, Um, so you might think it's because, well, uh, you can't have agriculture work unless I can be guaranteed to be able to come back and harvest my field that I planted. So there must be at least temporary property, property in that field or else I'm not gonna do it. And I think Rousseau thinks that's right, but he actually, but he thinks it's kind of backwards in the sense that like um, for there be the idea that I have a right to this field, there has to be foresight of consequences of violating other people's rights. Um, and so like the, the first thing that agriculture introduces is foresight. Like the discovery of agriculture is the discovery that if I do something now and wait, there'll be a reward for it. So that's the first thing. But then once I have that power of foresight, I also start to think about well, what? Well, why should I wait? Why don't I just go? Why should I do this now and wait? Why don't I just go take it from someone else that they planted? And then I'm like, oh, well, what will they do to me if I do that? And that's how property gets started. Yeah. Uh, you just haven't mentioned uh, like when when language comes in. Yet. No, I said it's not clear where language oh, comes okay. in in this story, right? I mean, he says some things about how at some point their language consisted just of gestures and whatever, but it's it's not. Um, I mean, it seems like these people have a fairly developed language. I mean, certainly the the savages that we know have that he knows of have language, right? Um, but also the idea that they're sitting around singing and dancing, it sounds like they, you know, must have language, but exactly how, when it reached what level, I, he doesn't, I agree, it's, it would be nice if he did, it seems important. <laughs> That's, yeah. So, um, 
Um, so it's really like the invention of agriculture brings about the state that uh, Locke would call maturity, so to speak, right? It's like the stage where we're free of the law of nature in Locke's sense, meaning that we can foresee the consequences, we can foresee punishment and reward. Um, uh, but notice Rousseau thinks we would have been better off stopping before maturity. So I guess if you ask what was that age we would have stopped at, a human life at, maybe the answer to that also is like childhood. I don't know, but in any case, so how does this follow from the invention of iron? Um, this is the explanation, and it's, um, like I said, even though it's wrong, it's really interesting. Um, it's on page 74, no, page 76. Once men were needed in order to smelt and forge iron, other men were needed in order to feed them. The more the number of workers increased, the fewer hands there were to obtain food for the common subsistence without there being fewer mouths to consume it. And since some needed foodstuffs in exchange for their iron, the others finally found the secret of using iron to multiply foodstuffs. From this there arose farming and agriculture on the one hand, and the art of working metals and multiplying their uses on the other, right? So what happened is, so apparently when they first discovered iron in the savage state, they were like, oh, we can use this to make better hunting weapons or something. Um, but unlike anything before iron, I guess the idea is that making iron was so complicated that people had to be dedicated just to doing that. Right, so it's the division of labor, the, the need for a division of labor comes in at this stage. You can't just like, as opposed to, I guess, making, you know, stone arrowheads or something, which, I mean, again, I, I don't know if this is probably not true, that, but, but at, at least according to Rousseau, there was no need for specialists in making any of the tools they had before that. But for making iron, it's, it's complicated and you need specialized knowledge and it takes a long time. And so like, if we're gonna have iron for our hunting weapons, the people who are hunting are gonna have to bring back more food to feed the people who are making iron. Um, and uh, eventually the, you know, the need for fewer and fewer people to bring in more and more food um, sparks the idea in someone, hey, we can use this iron to like plow the ground and plant and harvest. And that's gonna yield a lot more food than hunting did from the same amount of land. Um, so it's like not, um, it's not because of population pressure that they move to agriculture, but it's because um, they've gotten used to relying on this specialized labor and they need more efficient food production to, to support it. Um, So that led to agriculture, and agriculture led to property and land. And um, property and land led to inequality. How did it lead to inequality? So, um, you know, Locke does explain it partly by means of natural inequality, just the way Locke does, right? Like some people were more industrious or stronger or whatever were able to make more out of the same amount of land or something like that. But there's also 
this completely artificial source of inequality, um, which which comes out of the the very origin that law that uh, Rousseau assigns to it, which is that property arises because of this exchange of commodities that's going on, and because it arises from this exchange, um, there can be like. Um, unfavorable exchange rates between the two com commodities. This is farther down on page 76. The farmer had a greater need for iron or the blacksmith had a greater need for wheat. And in laboring equally, the one earned a great deal while the other barely had enough to live. Right, so the point is like, you know, um, What's happening now is that these people are producing food and these people are producing iron. So the question is like, how much food can I get from my iron? Well, so it depends partly on how much I want food and partly on how much they want iron. Like, um, um, if they really want a lot of iron, then they'd be going, willing to give me a lot of food. Or, no, that's not the way to put it. If they really need iron badly, they'll be give, willing to give me a lot of food for a little bit of iron. Let me read it again. Maybe he, I think he's, no, maybe he doesn't explain it that well. The farmer had a greater need for iron or the blacksmith had a greater need for wheat. Right, like, so in other words, basically the price of iron in wheat is, um, or the price of wheat in iron is going to depend on like supply and demand between these two groups. And so it can happen that the, like the farmer has to work really hard to produce enough food to get amount, the amount of iron that they need. Or it could be the other way, that the blacksmith has to work really hard to get enough food, uh, to, to produce enough iron to get the amount of food they need. Um, and whichever way it comes out, and I guess the point is there's no reason to think that it will come out equal, right? That, that, that the amount of labor that's required to produce the amount of iron that these people need is going to be the same as the amount of labor that's needed to produce the amount of uh, iron that these people need. There's no reason to think it'll be the same. So it probably won't be the same. It'll be different one or the other. It might fluctuate depending on the season or whatever. But so this is going to be a source of inequality, right? Like whichever one has a more favorable terms is going to be able to become richer than the other. Did that make sense? I thought there were hands raised and complaints. Right? I was just wondering, like, uh, so like initially there is kind of like this community that they're, they develop out of the need from developing iron, this uh, agriculture, but then all of a sudden they're no longer a community. They're like, they divide things among themselves or what? Yeah, because they, um, based on the labor or whatever? Well, I mean, like, I guess it goes in different stages. They don't quite maybe notice that it's happening even. Like at first, they're all still living. I mean, so first of all, when you say they were a community, like throughout most of the savage state, the way Rousseau um, presents it, they're a community when they come together to sing and dance or whatever, but each family is just like, has someone who's going out and hunting and bringing back food and that's enough to sustain that family. Yeah, but it seems like they develop this agriculture so they can feed the people that are making the iron, but then all of a sudden they're just like, uh, I don't know, like this trade system all of a sudden emerges or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, well, so, right, so the, the, the first thing that disrupts it is that, like, some people learn how to make iron, and then um, they, you know, for that reason, they become different from the rest of the people. But how are the, uh, like, how are these other people, like, 
wanting to make food for them anyway. <laughs> well, they, I mean, yeah, I don't, I, okay, so I don't think the stage that you, yeah, okay, I, maybe I know what you're asking. Doesn't the, I, doesn't trade kind of precede the invention of agriculture? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> yeah, because like, why do these people give food to the people who make iron to begin with? So, because before that, everyone was getting their own food and making their own tools. And they were only getting together for singing and dancing and stuff like that. So now, some people, you know, they discover this iron thing. And yet, they're not going to be able to have iron unless someone gets food for the iron making people. So these are like the first people who aren't getting their own food. And why do other people get them the food? So you're thinking at first it's kind of like communal, like yeah, I don't know. That's what I think. But 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 may, but that's actually given the way he he portrays the preceding state, that doesn't seem right because like in the preceding state, everyone was was providing for themselves. So it seems like really what has to happen first is that, you know, these people who are making iron, first of all, it seems like foresight has to develop at this stage, really, because the people who are making iron have to be able to figure out, well, if I spend all my time making iron, um, I'll be able to get someone else to feed me. And the reason the other people will feed, the, feed them presumably is because they're giving them iron in exchange for the food and the other people can't get their own iron. That's actually a really good question. So in other words, it seems like maybe, um, the agriculture thing is not necessary to introduce here. Doesn't agriculture precede iron? In real life, yes, but not in Rousseau's story. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that um, at the top of page 76, the invention of the other arts was therefore necessary to force the human rage to apply itself to that of agriculture. Once men were needed in order to smelt and forge iron, other men were needed in order to feed them. And then he goes on to explain. So, like at first, I get I take it that just meant more intensive hunting and gathering. But uh, eventually that became unworkable if someone realized, oh, we can do this. And he says, you know, um, uh, since some needed foodstuffs in exchange for their iron, the others finally found the secret of using iron to multiply foodstuffs. From this, there arose farming and agriculture, right? Yeah, so he's definitely saying that the invention of iron preceded the invention of agriculture. And like I said, that's not, you know, that's not right, but whatever. But I mean, so maybe also the, you know, the details here of how, the, but I'm interested because if the agriculture thing isn't necessary here, then it seems like property maybe doesn't start with land. Like, I mean, I think Rousseau wants it to go in this order because he wants to explain why property is in land. It seems like, like the iron makers are like, uh, control like uh, production or whatever. Right, I mean, and, and, you know, so I will say this, like whatever the details after the invention of iron, it's clear that, you know, that explanation of the origin of inequality that I just gave, I mean, it's only part of the explanation according to Rousseau, but it seems like it's important. And it's something that Locke um, um, can't bring in because as I kept pointing out, Locke ignores the use of tools as well. So yeah, so Rousseau is the one who's coming in and saying like um, the means of production 
are the are the origin of inequality and in property, even though he still thinks that property per se is mostly land. Um, Wait, I thought it was the exchange rate thing that produced property, which is like the like no, the exchange rate thing produces inequality in riches, right? Like one side has to work much harder to get what they need than the other does, so that means the others can get more than they need, basically. So they become rich. Yeah. Um, but sorry, um, if if the need to like accumulate property is there in the first place to like make exchanges and stuff like that, then isn't it? like like the the value of a certain good not just like like the good these people one side produces is yeah another way you could put it is that once the good that one side produces is more valuable than the good that the other side produces but you know i think that's another way of looking at the same thing um right it's that you know the re it's it's more valuable in the sense that they don't have to work as hard to produce enough of it to get their needs as the other side does that's 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 his that's the artificial that's the artificial origin of inequality according to rousseau Right, so, and, you know, so he goes on to say, thus it is that natural inequality imperceptibly manifests itself together with inequality occasioned by the socialization process. That's right after the thing I just read about how one needs iron more than the other needs wheat or whatever. So, like, there's some natural reason, some people are more industrious or whatever, they start to develop more property. But more importantly, like this, the way property originates, like has built into it reasons why one group is becoming is going to become richer than the other. So, um, so it's at this stage that civil society starts to become conceivable. Um, because only at this stage does the war that Hobbes anticipates and that Locke also in a way anticipates in the state of nature, it's only at this stage that war actually develops according to Rousseau. Um, Because again, first of all, at this stage, you have there are things that you can take away from other people by violence. It's not just honor, it's wheat and iron. You can take it away and have it for yourself. Um, and also, at this point, just like going away from someone else so you don't have to deal with them anymore is no longer an option. Right, because people are tied to the specific piece of land that they're on. So they're not mobile. Even, like in the savage state, I said it was sedentary. People have houses, right? But Rousseau says, like, if you know, these houses are not, maybe it's important that he calls them huts. These houses are not hard to build. It's the same point that Thoreau makes in a different context, right? That like um. So if they need to move to another neighborhood, it's easy. They just like go build a hut there. But now they can't really move. They have their field here. Um,
Um, and um, so that's another reason why war is possible, becomes possible now. And finally, war becomes not only possible, but likely, likely now, because it develops more and more a distinction between two groups of people, the rich and the poor. And the rich, um, number one, have something to lose, right? They have all this property. Um, and number two, they have a need for other people's labor. Like all this property won't do good and let do them any good unless they can use it to get other people to do stuff for them. So that's the rich. But then on the other hand, there's the poor. And the poor would rather just take the richest stuff than labor for them. <laughs> so um, so there's two sides who like have an incentive to use force against each other. Right? Like the, the, the poor would like to use force to take the richest stuff. And the rich would like to use force to make sure that the poor can't take their stuff and therefore have to work for them. Um, so, um, now, finally, everyone starts to assert the kind of unlimited right against everyone else that Hobbes thought we started with. Um, and um, now life, now that life, you know, here, as I said, life was solitary and brutish, but it wasn't nasty and short. Here, life is no longer solitary and brutish. It's getting towards becoming civilized. But it does become nasty and short <laughs> because there, now there's suddenly a continuous war. It's not a war of all against all, it's a war of the rich against the poor. Right? So, this, the next stage here is the war of the rich against the poor. And uh, Rousseau claims that now we finally are in a state that you would want to get out of, <laughs> right? Like up all this time, people didn't really have an, a reason to want to leave the state they were in, whether you call it the state of nature. And as I said, like in some sense, Rousseau will only call this the state of nature, but in some sense, you can call all of this the state of nature because it's still pre-civil society, right? There's still um, no difference in power among different people. Um, but, um, but now we want to leave the state, but Rousseau says, um, the only obvious way to get out of this state is one that would help the rich, but would be bad for the poor. Now, again, oh, I erased Sparta. Again, I think Rousseau thinks that there is another way out, but it's not obvious, and it requires very special circumstances to happen. Um, I mean, we'll see in the social contract that the the lawgiver, like like Hergus, is a very special type of individual. You can't expect to necessarily be there when you need them, for one thing. So, um, so what's the obvious way of this out of this? Well, the obvious way is somehow to stop this war. But if you stop the war now. The rich will have still be left with all their riches, and the poor have lost hope of taking it away from them. So obviously, this is good for the rich and bad for the poor. So I mean, uh, What's going to happen now? 
the state we're in is bad. Um, there is a possible way out of it. People start to figure out, but um, it's a way that's going to be to certain people's advantage and other people's disadvantage. And yet, what is the way out? Well, the way out is law, political society, right? It's not going to work unless the poor also cooperate. So how are we going to get into that state? I mean, so right, like this is completely different from the situation in Hobbes. In Hobbes, like in the, the, in the war of all against all, no one has anything to lose by leaving the state and going into the civil state. Because the, the state of the state of war of all against all was miserable for everyone, according to Hobbes. But here, even though, yes, this war is horrible, uh, leaving this war is going to leave the rich better off and the poor worse off. So how are we going to make this happen? And the answer is the poor have to be fooled into entering the new civil state. Right, so this is what Rousseau says on page 79. A rich man, pressed by necessity, finally conceived the most thought-out project that ever entered the human mind. It was to use in his favor the very strength of those who attacked him, to turn his adversaries into his defenders, to instill in them other maxims, and to give them other institutions that were as favorable to him as natural right was unfavorable to him. <laughs> and he goes, the, this rich man goes and gives a little speech to the, to the poor. I'm not going to read the speech because I'm out of time. But the speech sounds a lot like Hobbes or Locke about how it's to all our advantage for us to unite and have a common law that applies to everyone and whatever, whatever. But um, so it sounds just like that. But according to Rousseau, it's completely insincere. <laughs> the rich person actually knows that this is going to be good for them and not for the poor, but they're telling them this story. And um, This leads to, I mean, so like the story after this, I won't get into because I'm out of time, but it's basically like, first it leads to laws without government. Like at first they just say, oh, we'll make some rules. They don't realize yet that you need someone to enforce them. But then it leads to various types of government. And that's where this difference in power starts to come in. And then finally, that degenerates into a uh, like despotic, tyrannical government, and that's finally where we get the inequality between masters and slaves. That's like the final term of this development. And although, like Rousseau puts this thing in, saying, "Of course, I don't mean the king of France." Obviously, he does mean the king of France, <laughs> right? Like that's the stage we've reached now. <laughs> Um, and he also, I think, hints that religion is brought in to make this last stage happen, because he says something like, thankfully, we have religion that tells us that some people have the right to rule or something like that. <laughs> um, um, but the important point is that this transition here happens by deception. And that's what I meant when I said that at this point, Rousseau actually answers what the Academy really meant by that question. He doesn't emphasize it. And like I said, you can kind of explain that, right? Because emphasizing it would mean emphasizing the injustice of the present system. So uh, he doesn't mention it, but this is the answer. No, it wasn't authorized by the law of reason. It was a trick. Okay, that's all more than I have time for, so I'll see you on Thursday.